Zhang Zicheng, the most famous robber in the last century. He once got more than a billion yuan, about 130 million US dollars, from the richest man in Hong Kong by kidnapping his son and then kidnapped the second richest man in Hong Kong for nearly 100 million US dollars. He was well known all over the world, however, few people know the woman behind him, Luo Yan Fang, who was his wife, his advisor, and also his lady luck. I'll call her English name Maggie in the following. After Zhang was executed, Maggie escaped unscathed with hundreds of millions of cash. How did she become a winner in the serial crimes that were reported by the whole world? In 1959, four-year-old Zhang followed his parents to Hong Kong from Guangxi province to find a way out for their family. After entering Hong Kong, they found that Hong Kong was not full of opportunities and diamonds as they expected. Zhang's parents neither had skills nor legal identities, so they couldn't get jobs. Zhang's father could only open a small herbal tea shop in Yao Ma Te to make a living. At that time, Yao Ma Te was quite different from the prosperous Yao Ma Te nowadays, and most of the people living there were low-income, illegal residents or gang members. The neighborhood was not safe. In order to make money to support the family, Zhang's parents were too busy working to take care of their children. Zhang, who had no interest in studying, was absent from school all the time. In the face of poverty and harsh surroundings, Zhang believed that he could only make money by special means. At the age of 12, he joined the gang. At the age of 16, he was imprisoned for stabbing a guy. Unlike Zhang's family, Maggie, who was nine years younger than Zhang, was born in a stable middle-class family in Hong Kong. Her father was a teacher, and her mother was a staff in a consulting company. They raised her to be a well-behaved girl, hoping that she could also become a teacher in the future. This expectation was not difficult for Maggie, who was smart and had good grades at school. After graduating from university at the age of 20, she entered a private school to teach. If she had not met Zhang, her life might have been like what her parents expected, living an ordinary and easy life. But at the age of 20, she fell in love with Zhang, which changed everything. After Zhang was released from prison, his father was quite worried about his son going astray. So in order to make Zhang get back on the right track, his father sent him to a tailor shop as an apprentice. On the surface, Zhang seemed to study skills seriously and learn from the boss how to do business. In fact, he didn't quit the gang and still did things that were not entirely legal. Later, even the boss of the tailor shop became his accomplice. In 1984, Maggie, who had just graduated, needed to customize a suit. She went to a nearby tailor shop and met Zhang, who worked there. After meeting several times, she was deeply attracted to Zhang and felt that he was very special and charming. So they began dating, and their relationship developed rapidly. In 1986, they got married. After marriage, Zhang left the tailor shop and took out his savings to start a business. But he was not good at business, and he didn't earn big money as he wanted. In 1988, when his business was on the verge of closure, Zhang finally couldn't stand living a such life. One day, Zhang came home and confessed to Maggie, I used to be in a gang. Now I want to go back and do something big. I can't stand the life without money. He thought Maggie wouldn't understand and would be against him, but Maggie was so calm and even held his hands and encouraged him, saying, My dear, I support your choice. With Maggie's support, Zhang started to look for a fast way to make money. One day, in 1989, Zhang came home with a woman named Ai. He told Maggie that Ai was his friend and would stay in their home for a while in the future. He said he had a plan to get money and asked Maggie to quit her job to work with him. Although Maggie was a little jealous, she accepted her husband's proposal and resigned. She rarely saw her husband so excited and somehow she felt that their fate would change dramatically. A few days later, Ai took Maggie to the Wyan Security Company for an interview of the clerk in the logistics department. The Wyan Security Company was mainly responsible for the transportation and preservation of valuable goods for banks and companies. 
As a secretary, Ayi knew when there was a position vacant in the company. The position Maggie applied for could access specific transportation information, including goods and transportation routes. Maggie nearly understood what Zhang's so-called big plan was. After returning home that night, Maggie told Zhang that she had guessed what Zhang was planning to do and asked if her guess was right. This surprised Zhang a lot because he hadn't disclosed any information to her, but she figured it out. So Zhang confessed his plan. After listening carefully, Maggie pointed out the flaws in his plan and revised the deficiencies based on what she learned about the security company. She also told Zhang that she would inform him when there was an opportunity to carry out their plan. In early 1990, the truck that escorted Rolex gold watches to Kai Tak Airport was robbed, resulting in a loss of over 30 million Hong Kong dollars, equivalent to a nearly 4 million US dollars. Please keep in mind, that was in the 90s. The robbers were a group led by Zhang. Although he was listed as one of the suspects after the incident, the case eventually went unsolved due to the lack of direct evidence. Zhang tasted blood, and Maggie established a unique position in his heart. There is no relationship stronger than sharing benefits, especially for someone like Zhang, who regarded money as life. They used the money obtained from the first robbery as the seed fund and lay low to wait for the second opportunity. During this period, Zhang cashed in the robbed gold watches on the black market and bought guns and ammunition for preparation. He also made reliable members of the gang as accomplices. Maggie invested part of the money and made profits of hundreds of thousands of dollars. She continued working in the security company and kept an eye on company dynamics. On July 12, 1991, another opportunity came. A bank in Hong Kong needed to transport some cash to the United States and entrusted Wyan Security Company with the armored cash truck to transport a total value of 170 million Hong Kong dollars, equivalent to about 20 million US dollars, to Kai Tak Airport. Maggie, who had been informed of the company's transportation plan in advance, recorded the security deployment and began planning with Zhang how to hijack the cash truck. On the day of escorting the cash, just after the truck drove into the warehouse area of Kai Tak Airport and stopped, Zhang and four accomplices, armed with guns, suddenly appeared in front of the cash truck and quickly subdued the escorting guards. Then they drove the cash truck away as the pre-planned route. Although the Hong Kong police put in a lot of police resources to crack it, unfortunately all the three escorting guards were blindfolded and there were no valuable clues left at the scene. As before, Zhang still handed over the dirty money from this robbery to his wife to launder. To be cautious, Maggie bought houses and luxury cars with the money and only kept a small portion as deposits. The robbed cash was in consecutive numbers and had not been recorded in the system yet. The police contacted all banks in Hong Kong based on this clue and asked them to closely monitor accounts with large deposits and cash with consecutive numbers. This time, because of Maggie's negligence, Zhang was exposed to the police's attention. In September 1991, a bank informed the police that a woman had deposited 400,000 cash with consecutive numbers in their branch. This person was Maggie. The police quickly started investigating her and found that she not only worked in the Wyan Security Company, but also her husband was Zhang, who had many criminal records. This couple were highly suspected and soon got arrested. However, they never admitted that they were involved in the robbery. Fortunately, an escort officer's eye mask fell down a little due to sweat, which allowed him to see Zhang's face through the gap. At that time, all the other four robbers were wearing masks except Zhang. This escort officer identified Zhang as one of the robbers. Therefore, Zhang was sentenced to 18 years in prison by the court, while Maggie was released in court due to insufficient evidence. After Zhang was imprisoned, Maggie immediately hired two experienced lawyers at a high price to appeal for Zhang. After all, he had never admitted guilt from the beginning to the end, but his lawyers didn't win the case. Maggie turned to seek other ways. 
Finally, after discussing with the lawyer, she decided to use media to exert pressure on the Ministry of Justice. She contacted several mainstream media and held a public press conference. She tearfully claimed that Zhang was wrongly accused and the only witness against him was an escort officer. However, when the escort officer identified the suspect, he couldn't recognize Zhang at first, but went back to identify again after leaving the scene. The authenticity of this testimony was questionable. Maggie questioned whether the police designed such unreasonable testimony. Moreover, this evidence existed independently and couldn't form a chain of evidence which was not legally valid. She then cried that the police were eager to close the case and extorted confessions by torture. She lifted her skirt on the spot to show a long scar on her inner thigh, saying that it was caused by the police at that time. In the end, she said that her husband was innocent and hoped he could get justice as he deserved. During her speech, Maggie put herself in the position of a victim to gain sympathy, crying and condemning the Hong Kong police. Her speech quickly aroused discussion among Hong Kong. Under the pressure of public opinion, Zhang was released from prison without any criminal charges. When he walked out of the courtroom, he made a triumphant gesture towards the waiting media. This photo became the front page of major media. Not only that, Maggie filed an appeal with the police to claim compensation for Zhang's three-year unjust imprisonment. Eventually, the Hong Kong police compensated the couple with more than one million US dollars. After out of jail, Zhang drove his bright yellow Lamborghini around and showed reporters the scar on his chest caused by forced confession. The victory of this battle made Zhang regard Maggie as her lucky muse. He especially went to Thailand to find sculptors and asked them to carve several statues of the goddess of Hathor with his wife's face as the original model. He placed them in his home to bless him. Since then, Zhang became greedier and bolder. It is said that once he met Jackie Chan at a party, he had the idea of kidnapping Jackie Chan on the spot, but their mutual friend talked him out of it. He squandered the money on gambling and other vices. One day, his accomplices asked him, what we rob next? Zhang looked at the financial magazine in his hand and pointed to the top ten rich list in Hong Kong, saying, let's kidnap them one by one. After what Zhang had been through because of the last time he robbed, Maggie believed that this time they couldn't both get involved in the matter. If something happened, she should be the person to hire lawyers to fight the lawsuit and take care of their family. Zhang agreed with Maggie and also trusted her absolutely, so he was responsible for getting money in his way and gave the money to her for safekeeping. In May 1996, less than a year after Zhang was released from prison, he and his accomplices kidnapped Li Ka-shing's eldest son, Victor Li. In order to successfully kidnap him, Zhang sent people to follow Victor Li every day to understand his daily routine. After careful consideration, Zhang decided to kidnap Victor when he came off work. Zhang chose a perfect kidnapping location, which was a narrow one-way street bend near Victor's home. But before they took action, Zhang and his accomplices encountered an unexpected situation. Among the kidnappers participating in the operation, some were Hong Kong fugitives hiding in mainland China. They couldn't return to Hong Kong through customs, so they had to sneak back to Hong Kong on a fishing boat from Zhuhai City. As soon as they landed, they encountered two policemen patrolling nearby. The policemen thought they were stowaways and went over to check their IDs. The kidnappers knew once they were checked, they would be arrested. So one of them, Ye Jihuan, who was the first armed robber in history to use an AK-47 to rob and a wanted criminal with a reward of one million yuan from the police, told the policeman that he was going to get his ID. He then turned around behind the policeman, took out the gun he was carrying, and pointed it at the policeman to force them against the wall. Then he asked his accomplices to leave first. After his accomplices ran away, he tried to run as well, but the policeman shot him twice behind him. One shot hit his lower back, and one shot hit his leg. In this way, Yer's accomplices escaped, but Yer himself got caught and sent to Mary Hospital for treatment. 
After checking his fingerprints, the police found that he was the most wanted criminal, Ye Jihuan. The entire Hong Kong police were alerted because Ye and his accomplices came back to Hong Kong with guns. Although Ye didn't confess anything, the police knew that they couldn't do this for fun. They must have been up to something. Therefore, before the day that Zhang planned to kidnap Victor, the Hong Kong police had already been on high alert. Even so, it didn't affect Zhang's plan. He decided to take his chance and kidnap as scheduled. At 5 p.m. on May 23, 1996, Victor got off work and got in his blue Nissan President car. In Hong Kong, everyone knew that was Victor's car. This time, it exposed him to a danger. When the car drove out of his company's parking lot, Zhang's accomplices called Zhang and said, The boss is out. Then Zhang drove the jeep to catch up with Victor and stopped in front of Victor's car with another two cars of the kidnappers surrounding Victor's car. The kidnappers held a gun and asked Victor's driver to open the door, but the driver refused to open it at first until one of the kidnappers broke the front windshield with a hammer. The kidnappers dragged Victor and the driver to a van and took them to an abandoned chicken farm. The whole process took only ten minutes. When they were in the car, the kidnappers asked Victor to call his father, so Victor called Li ka Shing and said he was kidnapped and not to call the police. Zhang was thrilled that the money was about to be in his pocket. When the car arrived at the chicken farm, Zhang lifted Victor out of the car and kissed him. He told his accomplices excitedly that Victor was their money and asked them to watch their money carefully. Then, Zhang went to Li's house alone to ask for the ransom. His accomplices thought it was not safe for him to go alone, but Zhang said, and I quote, For the poor, money is more important than life, while for the rich, life is more important than money. To Li Kaxing, who is worth more than 10 billion, his son is way more important than money. He won't risk his son's life. Then Zhang went to Li's house alone. After knowing that his son had been kidnapped, Li ka Shing immediately returned home by helicopter and waited for the kidnappers at home. Soon, Zhang arrived. According to Zhang's later confession, when he entered the house, he introduced himself first and stated his purpose. He wanted to test whether Li ka Shing had called the police, so he deliberately said to Li, Let the police in your house come out. Li said he didn't call the police. Then, he took Zhang to check every inch of his house floor by floor, even opening the locked rooms for Zhang to check. There were indeed no police in his house. Next, they started to talk about the price. Zhang asked for two billion within three days. Li Kaxing said he had to ask the bank. So he called a bank manager in front of Zhang and said, I need cash within three days. How much can you raise at most? The bank manager said that within three days, all banks in entire Hong Kong could collect one billion in cash. Zhang was listening to their conversation the whole time. After Li hung up the phone, he said, It's not that I won't give you two billion. The bank doesn't have so much. Seeing that Zhang was hesitating, Li added, Well, I have 40 million cash at home. Let me give it to you first. Hearing this, Zhang smiled and said, Deal. One billion is okay. But he took out two million from the forty million and returned it to Li, saying that he only wanted one billion thirty-eight million because four is an unlucky number in China. By the way, Zhang, who was a gambler, was particularly superstitious. In addition to avoiding number four, he also did other things to increase his luck. For example, every time before they robbed, he asked all his accomplices to be away from women. After robbing the money, he always threw some money on the road to worship the gods. Back to the kidnapping case, that night, Zhang left Li's home with 38 million. The next day, Li ka Xing called Zhang at 10 a.m. and asked him to take away 500 million first. When Zhang arrived, the money had already been placed in a 12-seat van. Zhang drove the van away with the money. At 4 p.m. that day, he came to Li's house for the second time and took away the remaining 500 million. After getting the money, Zhang took Victor and the driver to a hotel owned by Li ka Shing and said to Victor, Please say hello to your father for me. I am a huge fan of him. Then he left, 
the largest bill of Hong Kong was 1,000, and the total of 1 billion cash weighs one ton. Zhang took away 35%, which was 380 million. In September 1997, Zhang once again led his accomplices to kidnap the second richest man in Hong Kong, Walter Kwok. They kidnapped him on his way to work, and the whole process was easier than expected. However, Walter Kwok was much more difficult to deal with than Victor. Walter Kwok was kidnapped to a house in the new territories that Zhang had rented in advance. The kidnappers ordered Walter Kwok to call his family and use the money to exchange his life, but he resolutely refused to call and even lectured the kidnappers. Then the kidnappers began to abuse him, chained his hands and feet, and locked him in a wooden box about only one meter long. Two days later, Walter Kwok couldn't bear it and called his family, telling them that he was kidnapped. This time, Zhang still went to Walter Kwok's home alone for negotiations, and they eventually reached an agreement that Walter Kwok's family gave him 600 million in cash within three days. In these two kidnapping cases, Zhang shared more than 700 million Hong Kong dollars, which was equivalent to nearly 100 million US dollars. He gave his mother and grandmother a total of 150 million, and gave Maggie 250 million leaving 300 million Hong Kong dollars for himself to spend. However, this money was quickly lost in gambling. His biggest loss in one day was 100 million in the Macau's Lisboa Casino. With the money, Maggie invested in apartments, villas, luxury cars, etc., with most of the property rights belonging to herself. Although they were awfully rich, they still owed the wages of their servants. After Zhang was arrested, the police found that he had a villa in Shenzhen and hired a couple to maintain it. However, the promised monthly salary of 1,000 yuan had never been paid since the beginning. On January 7th, 1998, he purchased 818 pounds of explosives, 2,000 detonators, and 750 meters of fuse from Guangdong. He wanted to blow up the prison and get Ye out of jail. However, before they could take action, the explosives he stockpiled were seized by the Hong Kong police on January 17th. Zhang immediately changed his name to Chen Qingwei and fled to Guangdong with his gang members, deciding to return to Hong Kong after the fuss died down. However, a week later, he was arrested by the mainland police. This was not the first time Zhang got arrested. He didn't panic at all and acted arrogantly when being questioned by the police. He thought that he would return to Hong Kong anyway, and his wife would hire the best lawyer and arrange everything for him. Hong Kong didn't have the death penalty, so Maggie tried everything to bring him back to Hong Kong to be on trial there. Like last time, she contacted the media many times. But her public statements only caused a ruckus for a while and didn't change anything. Because Zhang planned the crime in Guangdong, the mainland police had the right to pass a sentence. Plus, his accomplices all confessed to seek a reduced sentence. Half a year later, more than 40 accomplices of Zhang, including his accomplices' families, were successively imprisoned. Uh, 
The properties of Zhang, his wife and his mother were frozen. However, Maggie had already prepared for the worst and was not involved in Zhang's crime in recent years. On November 4th, 1998, after nearly three months of in-court defence by her lawyer, she and her mother-in-law successfully recovered their properties, but Zhang was sentenced to death. Maggie quickly sold her property for cash. As for how much she sold, no one knows. Some people say it is 500 million yuan, while others say it is 2 billion yuan. Since then, Maggie has lived somewhere with her children, and there have been no reports about her later.